After watching this video lecture, students will be able to identify matter using the matter flow chart. You'll also be able to differentiate between the subcategories of matter and describe each of them. Um, you'll be able to relate the relative size of particulates in heterogeneous mixtures. Um, and you'll be able to compare and contrast the features of homo and heterogeneous mixtures. So this is the matter flow chart, and the matter flow chart uh, is going to lead you down a series of questions that can help you to differentiate between the various types of matter. So what you would do here is basically take the flow chart and, okay, everything falls under matter. matter. Now, which categories or subcategories it falls under depends on the questions um, and how you answer them, okay? So the first question you're going to ask yourself is can they be physically separated or sub can the substance be physically separated? Meaning, um, if I filter something or distill off a liquid portion, um, will I be able to isolate various substances? And if the answer is yes, you have a mixture. If the answer is no, you have a pure substance. Um, now, if we continue down the right-hand side and look at pure substances, um, you want to then ask yourself, can it be chemically decomposed? So basically, are you going to be breaking bonds within the molecules? Um, and if the answer is yes, uh, you have a compound. If the answer is no, um, you have an element. Okay, and so if we go back over to the, the left side of the chart here, if we would have answered yes to our primary or, or initial question, um, the next uh, breakdown is going to be the type of mixture that you have. Okay, and there's two types. There's hetero and homogeneous mixtures. Okay, and so the first question is going to be, is it uniform in composition? If the answer is no, um, if you have chunks or you can't see through it, um, you're going to end up with what's known as a heterogeneous mixture. And heterogeneous mixtures um, can be broken down more specifically in col into colloids and suspensions. And we'll talk about the details of those um, a little bit later. Uh, if we would have answered yes to the uniform composition, uh, meaning that you, know, you can't tell that something is dissolved uh, in it, um, it can be it's see-through, um, that's going to be a homogeneous mixture. Um, and so in that situation, uh, we have... Uh, basically a uniform composition, we can see through the solution, um, and you basically have a homogeneous mixture in that case. So now that we've kind of looked at the questioning and how to progress through the flow chart, let's go ahead and let's understand the uh, categories and subcategories with a little bit more detail. So we're going to go ahead and start with defining pure substances, and we're going to start with the element category under the pure substance um, branch of the matter flow chart. Elements are pure substances that are made of only one type or one kind of atom. Um, and atoms are basically the smallest unit of any element that have the characteristics or the features um, of that specific element. And all the um, elements that you find on the periodic table obviously fall into this uh, element category of pure substances. Okay, And so some examples of things that are made up of um, elements are going to be like copper wire, aluminum foil, uh, gold, basically um, a lot of the things that you see um, maybe in your cabinets at home or maybe even in the garage. Um, you also have substances you might not actually see um, that you do interact with that are um, pure substances and specifically elements. Um, N2 and O2 are both components of the air that you breathe. Um, hydrogen gas would be another example of um, a, a element uh, that exists um, that you would characterize as a pure substance. Okay, and so these are all various substances that fall into the element subcategory of pure substances. Now, the other branch of pure substances uh, was represented by compounds. And a compound is um, a substance that's made of two or more different types of elements. Um, that are actually bonded to each other. And so what you need to understand about compounds is that they're going to have properties uh, that are um, unique to the compound itself, while the individual elements that make up the compound would have totally different characteristics and behaviors. Okay, And a great example of this is water. Um, so a water molecule is a single oxygen and two hydrogen atoms um, covalently bonded to one another. Okay, now we know water, uh, H2O, at um, room temperature is usually in the liquid phase. Um, and if we were to look at the individual elements that make up this compound, we have both hydrogen, okay, and we have 
um, oxygen. Both of these are actually gases at room temperature. Okay, so um, this molecule or this compound's uh, characteristic and features um, are definitely very different than the individual elemental um, components that make it up. Um, so the molecule uh, is the basically the smallest unit of any compound that has the features or the characteristics of that particular compound. Okay, so um, pure substances, we have elements and compounds. The elements are going to just be made of one type of uh, atom. Uh, compounds are going to be made up of two or more different types of atoms. Uh, and of course, the compounds uh, physical or, or excuse me, chemical characteristics are going to be unique from the individual atoms that make it up. Okay. So when talking about pure substances, uh, there's a couple of uh, laws that we want to kind of keep in the back of our head. Um, there's a law of definite composition and what that states is basically any substance um, is always going to have a specific um, fixed ratio of the elements in the compound. H2O, for instance, right, it's always going to have two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, and that is the chemical formula associated with water. Now, if I were to change that up, right, and have a compound that has the formula H2O2, that would be an entirely different substance. Even though it contains hydrogen and oxygen, um, the relationship in terms of the ratio of the specific elements involved change the characteristics of the substance. And actually, this substance is peroxide, okay? So that's actually very different um, in terms of behavior, reactivity, and all of that when compared to water. Now, the law of multiple proportions basically says that you can actually combine different ratios to have different substances, right? Okay, so obviously we've kind of already spoken about that here, but as another example, we have CO and CO2. CO is carbon monoxide, CO2 is carbon dioxide. As you can see, the ratios of carbon to oxygen in each of these compounds um, obviously are unique, and each of these compounds have different behaviors. Okay, So CO, carbon monoxide, behaves very differently, um, say, when it interacts with our red blood cells um, than the CO2 does. Uh, CO2 is readily released from our um, heme uh, group inside the red blood cells. Um, and basically that's part of our normal respiration process. Now carbon monoxide is more dangerous um, because of its characteristics. It bind, bonds more tightly to um, the heme in our red blood cells and basically makes it where there isn't that uh, location for oxygen and carbon monoxide to be exchanged. Okay, and so that's one of the reasons why CO or carbon monoxide is something that you know you worry about and make sure you have detectors and stuff in your house. Okay, so these are a couple things to know. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the other um, side of the matter flow chart. So mixtures, mixtures are gonna be basically a combination of two or more pure substances. Okay, so you can have you know just two things, two different uh, uh, pure substances whether they're elements and compounds or compounds and compounds. Um, but as long as you have a variable combination of the two, you end up with what is called a mixture. Now, uh, there's various different types of mixtures. The first type of mixture we're gonna look at are homogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures are ones that are gonna be uniform in composition. Um, another uh, way that we refer to homogeneous mixtures is that they are solutions. Okay, so in chemistry, when we say make a solution, we're talking about making a homogeneous mixture. Okay, now some characteristics associated with homogeneous mixtures um, are first, that they have very small particles. Okay, number two, they don't have the Tyndall effect. Okay, so what Tyndall, the Tyndall effect is, um, is basically when you shine a light, uh, like you see here, through or into a sample, um, basically, uh, particles that are inside the sample will basically cause diffraction of that light. Okay, so if you have the Tyndall effect, um, you'll have diffraction. If not, you'll have it pass through, just like you see in this example here. Okay, so homogeneous mixtures are going to allow light to pass through. Okay, um, the other thing that we uh, experience or observe for homogeneous mixtures is that the particles in the solution do not settle. Okay, so they stay, stay in the solution. You can't tell that they're there because they're very small. Okay, and so you'll basically have this nice uniform mixture. You can shine a light through or see through, um, and you subsequently don't see any particles settling. Okay. 
Okay, and some examples of this would be like rubbing alcohol. If you ever look on the container of the rubber al rubbing alcohol that you have in like your closet or uh, you know maybe your uh, med kit, usually it has a percentage. Okay, so it'll be like 70% or 90% isopropyl alcohol. Um, that is basically the amount of alcohol uh, versus water that you find in that sample. And basically, so rubbing alcohol is an example of taking two different liquids and mixing them. Air is an example of a gas-gas mixture. Air has nitrogen and oxygen and various other gases in different proportions. Okay, so that's a gas-gas mixture. Sugar and water or Kool-Aid and water would be an example of a solid mixing with a liquid. Okay, and when you put uh, those two together, you know, you create this nice uniform mixture with small particles. There's not going to be any settling. You can shine a light through. Um, and these are the characteristics of homogeneous mixtures. So um, on this chart, I have some more examples of your various types of um, solutions, right? We can have gas-liquid mixtures, okay? So in this case, you know, like carbonated water or soda, it's a great example. Um, we can also have liquid-liquid, wine, right? Solid liquid, salt water would be another example. Gas, gas, we already spoke about air. Um, now you can also have solid, solid mixtures, okay? And in those situations, uh, some of the markers, such as like no Tyndall effect, kind of get thrown out the window. So we're gonna talk about that a little more here. So alloys are actually a special type of homogeneous uh, solution or homogeneous mixture. Um, and basically what happens in, in alloys is that you take uh, two or more metals and you mix them. So usually you'll melt them down, mix them up, um, and then use them for their various purposes. And one of the reasons why we do this uh, is to take, you know, coins or, or excuse me, or, or metals that are softer, um, but maybe, you know, valuable or, you know, pleasing to the eye, beautiful, um, but we want to be able to have them be a little harder, um, a little stronger so that they are more durable when we put them into ring form or earring form. And so we'll add in some other elements to make it where it hardens up a little bit. Okay, and so um, when you look at your ring, you know, you can't really tell that there may be some copper or silver in there. It just looks like a gold band. Okay, and so that mixture is uniform in composition. Now, because it's a solid and the particle spacing uh, is obviously um, limited, what ends up happening is that we can't apply the Tyndall effect to uh, this uh, type of solution. So although it still is a homogeneous mixture, um, it obviously doesn't follow the Tyndall effect just by the nature of um, the state of the matter. So let's go ahead and let's now move on to the other side of the mixture subcategory. We're gonna look at heterogeneous mixtures. So heterogeneous mixtures are actually mixtures that are not uniform in composition. Um, and we'll talk about what I mean by uniform here in a minute, but um, in the heterogeneous mixture subcategory is a sub subcategory, um, and it breaks down into suspensions and colloids. Okay, and so we're going to start with suspensions because I think they're the most intuitive. So suspensions have large particles. Okay, if I try to shine a light through, there's going to be big enough particles to cause bounce back, you know, or diffraction. And if you leave um, a suspension long enough, the particles will settle. Okay, so all of these examples um, that we see here fresh squeezed lemonade or fresh squeezed orange juice, muddy water, you know, uh, obviously when there's pulp inside the fresh squeezed lemonade or orange juice, you know, you have chunks floating around. Um, in muddy waters, you know, you can usually see that there is, you know, some sort of uh, sediment or some sort of uh, particulate that's present inside the mixture. Okay, and so and if we were to take a cup of muddy water um, and a cup of orange juice um, that's freshly squeezed with pulp and leave it in uh, on the countertop overnight, when we came uh, by in the morning, obviously we would have some solid particles down at the bottom. Okay, so heterogeneous mixtures, they're not going to be uniform. You're going to be able to see um, that there is definitely some larger particulate in the mixture that will eventually settle um, given some time. So. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the other option of heterogeneous mixtures. Let's go ahead and look at colloids. So a colloid is also a heterogeneous uh, mixture. Um, it has medium-sized particulate. Um, it does experience the Tyndall effect. Okay, light will scatter if you try to shine a light through it. The difference here though is that particles don't settle. So because the particles are not really large, um, they don't settle down to the bottom of the container and that's kind of necessary. So one of the examples here, um, we have baby formula. Obviously, we don't want baby formula to be able to precipitate out, 
right? We want it to stay in solution state, um, basically distributed or dispersed through, um, you know, the water because we want the baby to be able to easily um, take in the food and, and, and digest, okay? Um, so other examples are also like whipped cream. Okay, so whipped cream, when you uh, make whipped cream, you know, you'll put some sugar in there, um, into the heavy cream, and then what you do is you beat in air. You take that whisk and you start um, basically whipping away. What you end up doing is bringing air into um, the cream, and that basically causes, you know, the whipped cream to form, and you can put that on top of your, you know, brownies and other delicious uh, snacks. Um, cheese is an example as well. Fog is another one. Okay, so those of you who are working on getting your license, you know that you should never um, turn your high beams on when it's foggy outside. Um, and the reason why is because you'll get uh, basically light refraction, you'll get bounce back, and that can cause you to have difficulty seeing in front of you, even worse than the fog is already causing. Okay, so these are all examples of colloids. Remember, colloids are part of the heterogeneous subcategory and just have some unique features that differentiate it from the suspensions. So now what we're gonna do, guys, is we're actually gonna take our matter flow charts out and we're actually going to apply um, the matter flow chart to identify the type of substance we have in each of these examples. Okay, so in this first example, um, if we look at the flow chart, obviously we're gonna start with matter because that's where they're all gonna start. Okay, now, if we look at this substance here, we have a solid, they've given us a chemical formula this is the formula for potassium dichromate, okay? And so if we look at that, we notice that we don't have multiple things present. So we're gonna say matter, okay? Um, it, it can't be physically separated because you'd only be separating out, you know, crystals from other crystals that are the same thing. So um, in terms of going right or left, we're gonna go to the right and say that this is a pure substance. Okay, so we say pure substance. Um, and then to decide if we have a element or a compound, right, uh, if it can be chemically decomposed or broken down. So can we break this formula down into simpler elements? If the answer to that is yes, then obviously you have a compound, okay, which is what you have here, okay? Now, in this example here, we have a diamond, okay? Um, if you notice here, they've given you the element um, that makes up. Uh, the the substance that you see there, the diamond that you see there. Okay, so once again, we start with matter. Okay, we have pure substance. Okay, because there's only one thing present. Okay, and then in terms of it being able to be uh, chemically decomposed, there's literally only one element type. Okay, so it has to be an element. Okay, now here we go with another example. We have potassium dichromate dissolved in water. Right, okay, so we've taken this solid um, and put it together with water, okay, so that's gonna fall into the matter category. Okay, now, because there's more than one thing there, it's gonna be a mixture, okay? Now, is it uniform in composition? It is uniform in composition, right? And if you look at it, you can actually see through it, right? So we know that this is gonna be a homogeneous mixture, okay? And we're going to go ahead and now move over to our last example here. Once again, we're going to start with matter. Okay, this is water, right? So matter, um, pure substance, okay? Because, of course, H2O, right? Okay, it's just one thing, okay? And then uh, the H2O molecule here, right? We have more than one type of element present in that molecule so it can be decomposed into more simple um, pieces okay so we're gonna have a compound here okay so this is how we use the matter flow chart you guys are gonna have some practice with that later uh, but this is just uh, matter and its identification